Okay, perfect. We're live. Okay. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Livingstone. I'm the chairperson of the MHAG for the City of Cambridge. Thank you for joining us today as we stream live on the City of Cambridge YouTube channel. If there are any issues with technology tonight impacting this meeting, the meeting may be recessed at the direction of the chair or the host to confirm that the electronic format is performing effectively before proceeding further with the agenda. A reminder for those watching, the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, MHAC, is, as the name suggests, an advisory committee that makes recommendations that then go on to council for a decision. I will now hand it over to the recording secretary to do a roll call. Thank you. Uh, Sue Brown sends her regrets. Natasha Beaton sends her regrets. Nelson Cecilia. I'm here. Michelle Goodrich. Here. Kimberly Livingston. Present. Jack O'Donnell. Here. Nancy Woodman. Here. Okay, thank you. So disclosure of pecuniary interests. It's a reminder to the members of the committee that the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act requires committee members to declare any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in relation to a matter under consideration. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we will move forward with this meeting. So our first item is the approval of the May 18, 2023 MHAC minutes. Um, members of the committee, can I have a mover and a seconder to place this motion on the floor? So I have Nancy for the mover and Nelson for the seconder. Um, so the recommendation is that the minutes of the May 18th, 2023 meeting of the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee be considered for errors and omissions and be adopted. Do any members of the committee have any questions? Nancy? Yes, there is a error on the bottom of page six. It discusses in the last paragraph, it uses a term photo light metrics okay. and that should be photo metrics. Okay, thank you. Are there any other um, comments or questions? Okay, so seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call for a vote. Okay, <clears throat> Doc O'Donnell, how do you vote? In favor. Nelson Cecilia, how do you vote? In favor. Nancy Woman, Woodman, sorry, how do you vote? In favor. Michelle Goodridge, how do you vote? I wasn't there, so I'll abstain. Okay, so then an abstain's going to count as an opposed, okay? Just so you you know, in accordance with our procedure bylaw. Uh, Kimberly Livingston, how do you vote? I'm in favor. Okay, and that motion carries at a vote of four to one. Okay, thank you. So I think now we are ready to... Um, go into our presentation. So we have Paul Williams, the sustainability planner, here to give a presentation on the park's master plan. So welcome, Paul. Thanks very much. Um, welcome everybody and, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, I am speaking to, I believe most of the advisory committees, um, but MHAC is my first stop. So I'll just ask you to be gentle with me. Um, I do have a, a bit of a presentation here and then a uh, discussion at the end, Madam Chair. Uh, if the committee wishes to go into discussion, I'm, I'll be here for the duration of that uh, or any questions. Uh, next slide, please. And you can go to the next one. So the Parks Master Plan uh, got underway a few months ago. And um, so we're just, as I said, in, the, in sort of our consultation phase at the moment. And just for uh, context, um, you know, we, we are taking sort of the, the direction from uh, the city strategic plan, um, the, the one in place right now. I know that it's, it's likely going to uh, be updated very soon, but the parks master plan really uniquely uh, 
well, uniquely in terms of a lot of master plans, connects to quite a bit of the strategic plans. So the the people, place, and prosperity, and there are, are dovetails, you know, to uh, to each one of these sort of broader uh, goals and objectives. Uh, next slide. A little bit more of an involved slide. Um, I won't take you through it in, in great detail, but up at the top, we sort of have the strategic plan, mapping and analysis, and our public input. Um, and that all will be distilled down into levels of service. So we're going to try to, as much as possible, um, you know, have, uh, and I'll get into levels of service a little bit later in the presentation, um, but we'd like to have a, a council approval on that. So we're sort of taking a pause um, after we sort of have some initial consultation and uh, going to council and saying, council, this is what we've heard from the public. Um, this is some of the analysis, some of the preliminary analysis we have, and we'd like you to provide us with direction so that we can build a, a, a master plan upon these levels of, upon the framework of the levels of service. About a year later, or I guess about nine or 10 months later, we'll go back to council uh, with the Cambridge Parks master plan. And on the sort of the right-hand side there, you can just sort of see, I, I put the MHAC uh, uh, acronym there. Um, really, we're looking for, you know, input um, at, at a lot of different junctures, actually. We have surveys and public meetings. I'll get to that in a moment. But but basically, if there are, um, uh, you know, input for the levels of service or the draft master plan itself, that's usually where the advisory committees um, sort of have a, a comfort level or, or a that's the usual practice is to to comment upon um, some sort of a written document from from the city. So that'll happen with the with the draft master plan and and to a lesser extent the levels of service. But that'll be going to council um, after the draft after the master plan is approved. Of course, um, there are then you know more finer levels of detail, granular levels of detail and specific parks plans, uh, specific projects that are going on. Um, and those all obviously all require council approval as well. Uh, next slide. Um, the project timeline, if I was to break up the parks master plan into to three sort of phases, we're just in the middle right now of, of or just sorry, at the end of phase one, um, which was sort of our preliminary phase gathering information and consultation. So, stakeholder interviews, we held a council workshop. Uh, we've been doing a lot of mapping and, and background research, and we've had several public meetings and a survey. And really in June and September, um, we're visiting the advisory committees um, and a few others such as the neighborhood associations. Uh, as we sort of move into summer and fall, uh, we will have a second survey that'll be going live, I believe, July 1st or shortly after, uh, as well as a public meeting in the fall. And as I mentioned earlier, a council decision on, on levels of service. The final phase, of course, uh, uh, next year in 2024 is bringing a draft master plan forward, um, having a public meeting on that and then the council decision. Uh, next slide, please. So City of uh, Cambridge Parks, just some kind of background uh, information for you. Um, and just forgive me here, I just have to move the faces to be able to see the slide. Uh, so Cambridge has, a, I, I should just mention right up front, we are still um, updating the mapping. I think we're almost done. So I, I felt pretty confident putting these numbers up, but they, they might change slightly in the, in the future. So Cambridge has 165 properties. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't quite call them park properties. Obviously, I did here, but they're they're properties. Everything from a natural area, uh, you know, small sort of remnant piece of natural strip of land that we got maybe through a development uh, proposal, to you know, all the way up to Riverside Park and hundreds of hectares. Um, the 165 properties in, include, as I mentioned, Riverside Park, which is our citywide park. A number of community parks, neighborhood parks, uh, two outdoor recreation facilities dedicated to those specific sports. Um, a POPS, so forgive me, I should have spelled that out. A POPS is a privately owned 
public space, which is a kind of a new concept for Cambridge, and, and that's the Gaslight District uh, uh, public space. Uh, parkettes, urban squares, trailheads, and 66 natural areas. So we have more than 500 hectares of parkland, um, but only about a you know 20 percent or, or 25 percent. 135 hectares of that is is what we would call developed uh, or manicured, or there's a number of adjectives I could use. Um, the majority of the lands are natural uh, and undevelopable. So uh, at no point would they become a soccer field or a uh, a turf park area um, and protected. Along with that, a uh, number of the natural areas and, and their buffers have, have trails. So we do have about 80 kilometers of trails through through parks and and then along roads and you know through storm ponds and walkways. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few um, kind of highlights about the park master plan. It's a 30-year plan. Um, this horizon really is, is consistent with the official plan, which will be starting, I, I believe, either late this year or next year, early next year. Um, and But we will have sort of a, a much more detailed 10-year um, kind of plan within that. Uh, but it is important to take that long view. We, we really only get one chance um, with development, as you know, and and... So, you know, highlighting where the city wants to see parks or, or you know, how many parks we'll need is, uh, is the justification that we take through the Parks Master Plan uh, into development applications, into, you know, purchasing lands. Um, so we really do need that 30-year that time frame. Um, stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned, will happen at various stages. And uh, I did also mention we'll... we'll have a framework or a foundation of, of levels of service um, growth. So at this point, we're taking um, sort of the latest growth projections are looking at about a 50% increase in population. So an additional 68,000 residents by 2051. Um, some back of the envelope calculations, you know, we'll, we'll need to have about 50% more parkland. So 64 hectares of developable parkland. Um, in addition, we, we do need to identify the amount of land uh, needed to be acquired to meet current demands. So on top of that, we have underserviced areas in the city that, that actually the person doesn't have a park within walking distance, or we have growing sports that, uh, that really do need additional lands and uh, to, to service sort of their, their sports. So some of those are, are cricket, tennis, pickleball. Uh, soccer seems to be well served at the moment with the Fountain Street facility going in. Uh, but those all are sort of the, the demand side of things that, that we're seeing. Uh, it is a plan for new parks um, and new types of parks and, uh, and also the challenges of, you know, the demographic changes and intent. Well, not the challenges of demographic changes. We have demographic changes going on, but the challenges of intensification. And, you know, having a park within walking distance of, of all of these areas that are going to be growing upward. Uh, it is a chance to update our mapping. Uh, we do have either, I think they're on the books now, but we're going to see further regulations around asset management. Um, so there's a regulatory aspect to this. We, we do have to um, show that we're managing our, our parks. And, and to some extent, they are managed already. Playgrounds, for example. Uh, have a lot of asset management around them. Uh, levels of service, of course, is, is coming more and more into municipal management. And uh, we'd like the plan also to speak to budgets and operations. Next slide, please. So we do have a recreation master plan that will be starting up, I believe, a little later this year. Again, perhaps early next year. Um, in the past, we've always had a well, we've always we've had one <laughs> parks and recreation plan, so we've we've divided them up now. The parks plan is dealing mostly uh, with with land, um, outdoor recreation, and, and the, those amenities. The recreation master plan will deal with indoor recreation facilities, things like that. Um, there is some overlap. There is some gray area. For example, with tennis, uh, we have outdoor courts. There's a move to go to indoor courts, so we're working out 
you know, where, where should that, where's the home for tennis, for example, or the different aspects of tennis right now, it's both. Um, and of course there's ongoing projects going on as well. So the development charges, uh, background study is being updated. Uh, we have an operations facilities master plan that just started. I mentioned the official plan and their ongoing secondary plans. So it's a bit of a juggling act, keeping um, all of these things in line. And, and uh, chicken and egg is a is a saying we use quite often with this project because sometimes it feels like the the chicken is coming before the egg. Uh, but we're we're muddling through. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to review quickly. Um, uh, this is sort of uh, very new um, yet old. We've taken a lot of our park classification types from our uh, former park master plan and we've just updated them a bit. I will mention right off the bat, this has been a very difficult exercise, exercise because there are so many um, parks that do not fit the definitions. And so we've written definitions uh, for all of our class classes, but there are a lot of exceptions, as I said, and, and we can, um, you know, we, we've done our best to try to slot them in where we think they best fit. So types of uh, parks that we have in the city, we have city park, or sorry, one city park, Riverside Park, and this is a very large park. It's, uh, you know, it's all about a lot of different amenities, unique amenities. Um, it's a it's a park that draws people from, from outside of Cambridge as well as from all over the city. Next slide, please. Community parks are sort of the next size in parks. They're usually very large, um, but they can be smaller. Uh, they do serve sort of, a, again, a larger community. They are, in, in sort of layman's terms, we call these drive-to parks as opposed to walk-to parks. Um, and they really are characterized by sort of the bigger recreational uses, washrooms, um, larger amenities like splash pads and sports fields. Uh, next slide, please. In contrast to community parks, neighborhood parks are the ones that we call walk to parks. Uh, they don't have parking lots. They don't have splash pads, washrooms. Um, they are relatively passive. Uh, there are a few exceptions where, uh, you know, quite a few recreation uses or a sports field might have been shoehorned into a, a neighborhood park uh, for historical reasons. Um, they have, I, I think I mentioned they have no parking or very limited vehicular access. Um, and they're generally really not suited for sports play. They, because of that, um, you know, that the, the the surrounding streets get full of park get full of park cars and and, um, and it, it's not a good situation to have uh, recreation there. I think long term we'd like to move the sports out into sort of the bigger bigger community parks. Next slide, please. Uh, urban square. So this is a, a new kind of classification we're bringing in. Um, and I, I almost want Urban Square together with um, Urban Green here. Um, urban Square are, you know, small spaces generally, uh, although I see Mill Race Park is here as an example, um, which is a little bit larger. And they are, you know, characterized as being in our urban core areas. Um, they have seating, special event and vista functions. Uh, they rarely have any recreation or sport activities in them. And uh, in, as I said, in contrast to urban greens, they're primarily hard surface. Uh, next slide, please. So urban greens are, are some people would call these par parquets. Um, they're small kind of open spaces, again, seating, vista, gardens, and uh, they're differentiated from trailheads as not being linked to a trail from urban squares as being more vegetated. And, uh, and, and they're located around the city as well. Uh, next slide, please. A trailhead, uh, pretty simple definition. They, they can include parking. Um, they're usually a very small piece of land. Uh, and again, wayfinding signage, pavilions, garbage, 
uh, and a few sort of other amenities might be associated with this small piece of land. Next slide. Outdoor recreation facility is, a, a, again, a new classification. So right now we have two of these in the city. One is in uh, Galt. Uh, the other is just outside of Blair. So Waterworks Park is uh, uh, baseball diamonds. Fountain Street Soccer Complex uh, is currently under construction. These are limited access areas. So they will be fenced. Um, they're bookable. They're premium recreation facilities. And there really aren't any other neighborhood park amenities here. They're really not meant to be the park you walk to and kick a ball around. Um, they're really for that, that kind of focused uh, sport that is, is outdoors. Next slide, please. Uh, Pops, as I mentioned, is, a, is also a new category and Strata Park is, is one that we are also uh, introducing. So Pops are very small, um, you know, usually urban square type of uh, areas, but they are privately owned. So they're not owned by the city and there are agreements around them about how the city uh, would interact with the, the owner, um, you know, either programming them for events uh, or, or other amenities. Strata parks are, are a little bit different. Um, they're a, a city park, but they're located on top of something. So on top of buildings or structures, it's usually pretty low parking garages, and then you put a park on top of it. Um, and again, it's it's these are parks that we will see increasingly due to intensification. Next slide, please. Uh, natural areas. So as I mentioned, this is the bulk of our parks. You know, almost 360, 370 hectares. They range from very uh, well, very natural. <laughs> Algonquin Park Natural, um, they, they range from, you know, basically pieces of like a wetland or a woodlot to uh, some programming, whether it's the adult fitness stations like you see in the, the middle photograph or, you know, trails and, and uh, boardwalks that you see in the far right. Um, but generally they're, they're for natural uh, uh, area protection or natural features protection. Next slide, please. So engagement and consultation, I did mention we've, we've had a public meeting, a survey. Uh, we've had several key informant interviews and, and a specific meeting with sports groups and recreation interests. We are just about to launch our second survey. It, this one will be uh, a very sort of in park. What do you think of your local uh, park type of survey uh, with another question about safety and another question about uh, how people rate uh, the amenities in the city. Uh, we will have a public meeting in the fall, I believe, as well as the, the council decision on levels of service, and then uh, the draft plan public meeting and, and likely another round of going back to advisory committees before going to council with the final draft plan. Uh, next slide. So what we've heard so far um, in general, and this is very generalized, uh, we, we did have quite an extensive survey and lots of input so far. We, we've heard that people want an increased variety of amenities. They want uh, to upgrade park amenities, newer equipment, improve park maintenance, and, and also have more passive amenities within existing parks, such as pathways, seating, shade, and open space. Next slide. So the improvements really are around more parks. Um, as I mentioned, there are some places in the city that are under service at the general at, at this time. People want to see more natural areas, uh, park washrooms, and shade. Uh, next slide. And next slide. So levels of service, as I, I said, they are the foundation, or they're one of the foundations for building the park's master plan. Um, we will see council approval in this autumn um, on those levels of service. And basically it involves, you know, rating our, our current all the, the, the stand, or all the standards, all the amenities, and, and then setting sort of a, you know, this is our current level of service, this is a higher level of service, and what do people think of these options, um, and what does council think of these options, where should we be aiming, and once we have that information, we can, we can build the draft plan upon them. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm, I'm not going to go through all the levels of service. We have about 30 to 40, um, but I've tried to sort of group them here. Um, so land use planning ones, these are sort of important ones that we use with developers walk, and, and also residents. I mean, walking distances to parks and square meter of parkland per person. Um, you know, this, the second one is a little bit more esoteric that the first one we all kind of get, you know, I want a, a park within a five to 10 minute walk from my home. Square meters of parkland per person is really important when you get those, um, you know, 30 story, 40 story buildings coming in. The population of St. Jacob's suddenly dropping down in one hectare, you have 2,000 people. 2,000 people, if we have a, a level of service of 10 square meters per person, we need two soccer fields to, to, uh, to service those people. And even that, think about 2,000 people on two soccer fields. Um, so that that's a very important one square meters of parkland even though it's a little bit uh, difficult to get our heads around sometimes passive amenities so everything from washrooms to garbage bins and lighting uh, furniture you know things like benches table gates shade structures active amenities disc golf some of the new ones there skate parks and of course um, organized sports facilities and and their fields uh, next slide please so developing levels of service, we, we start with a community definition, you know, so park should be within a reasonable walking distance of my home. And then we turn that also, or we build on that, but build upon that, a technical definition. So, you know, is it five minutes and 400 meters or 800 meters and 10 minute walk? And as I mentioned earlier, we will develop uh, for most of them four options, a uh, lower level of service, which you know, might be a savings, might be a better way to put that, um, you know, the city putting less resources to something, the current level of service, a higher level of service, and then a premium level of service that, you know, that might, um, we might be at a higher level of service right now. And, and the next sort of progression is, is to what we are calling a premium level of service. And finally, we, we do need to develop meaningful and measurable performance indicators. So in the, in the example of uh, walking distance, um, for example, it might be 90% of households are within 800 meters of a neighborhood park. Next slide, please. Um, so just to kind of tee up discussion or questions, and, and as I said, I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, the chair and the committee whether you want to have the discussion now. Um, next slide, we'll just sort of look at a few things here. First of all, I, there are a number of heritage um, related things going on with the parks. Uh, so heritage assessments as with Forbes Park um, and, and the, uh, the others that you see there, Ferguson Homestead um, and so on. Uh, so we are available, Laura and uh, Jeremy have been in touch with the, uh, the parks group. Uh, so we do, you know, we will keep up to date on, on this. And of course we have a number of these um, uh, there were a number of heritage resources located within parks. Um, and, you know, through the development process, we seem to be getting more, such as the stone uh, stone tower at, uh, uh, with the uh, Hesper, with the Forbes Estate uh, development. Uh, next slide. So the, the question's really simple. Um, how and when would you like to be consulted? Uh, we know that some advisory committees prefer to strike a subcommittee. The subcommittee members come to public meetings and uh, they, they table comments to the group and the group votes and so on. So just for our, our benefit, you know, if, if there is sort of a, a preferred method, we'd like to support that. Um, what are some of the areas of interest through MHAC, through the MHAC lens um, that the Parks Master Plan should address and include? So they, this might be very general statements with the very last thing being a very specific statement. Um, I, I, but 30 years ago now, it, no, 25 years ago, I, I had a, a person on a committee who came always very, very prepared with very specific recommendations. So if, if there is somebody out there with a very specific recommendation, I would like to hear it tonight or in the future. Um, we are collecting those as we go along because there's a lot of great ideas that we hear um, that translate instantly to a recommendation. And, and so um, if there is something specific out there, please speak up. 
Uh, next slide, I believe, is the final slide. So we can go back, maybe, uh, Karen, to to uh, that one. Yeah, I, just uh, if you can go back uh, to the final one. Yeah, I love that. I love that picture. So it's just uh, it's it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. It was the Forbes Park waiting pool. Um, I almost saw myself in there, <laughs> but I wasn't. I don't think I was that age. Uh, uh, one of the boys on the right uh, that this is probably taken in the, the 50s um, but yeah it, just a great photo I love uh, a lot of the archival photos but if you can go back uh, Karen to the, the slides or uh, or we could just conclude the presentation now and uh, go to questions or discussion and thank you yeah thanks so much for the presentation Paul um, I think we can go to the committee now and see if they have any questions or comments? Um, Councillor Kimson? Oh, I think you're on mute. Hello? I'm not hearing the councillor is. Yeah, me either. Might be some technical difficulties or okay um why don't we we'll go move over to michelle and um and give councillor kimson a chance to to work on her audio michelle hey yeah uh thanks paul for the really thorough uh presentation tonight i i learned a little bit um it's nice to see our parks um being represented um so my, I guess, area of interest um, or thing I would flag would be in light of Forbes Park being designated uh, in its entirety and not just the amenities within it, I'd be curious to see within this park plan some thought or consideration on whether the heritage assets that you listed on the previous slide would be considered perhaps as individual assets and you would be looking to perhaps have those designated if they are not, I know some are, or if you would be looking at some of our older parks, so I'm thinking, you know, Soper Park and um, uh, Riverside Park as a whole uh, to be designated uh entirely or to be looking at maybe cultural heritage landscapes for those areas. Um, I'm not saying it has to go that way, but just some some thought and consideration if it's, uh, again, how, how do you handle those sort of situations to then have obviously new amenities, new growth, new use, but still making sure that we're uh, keeping, you know, all of the historic features and assets within these parks um, protected, or I'm glad someone mentioned Forbes Park, or sorry, um, Jacob's Landing and the Forbes uh, Estate Tower that's going to be moved over, same sort of thing. So we've got some parks that are very, very old. They've been in the city for a very long time. Um, and how do you handle that? How do you handle individual assets? And are we looking at designating some of the older park spaces as cultural heritage landscapes or as an entirety, kind of how we did um, with Forbes Park? Yeah, and I, I, um, I don't know if I have an answer for you, Michelle. I, I, I think the sort of the response back that I would have, it, and I'm not trying to weasel out of this, is I, I'd really take my direction from the advisory committee and council on, on that. Um, I can see. So when you started mentioning the examples, um, you know, I'm thinking of the. You mentioned Soper, so I'm thinking of the the bridge arch, and um, um, for example. I know we have the tennis club. Now the tennis club is in on the other side of the creek, for example. Um, but just imagine, I guess I'm, I'm trying to put a, a scenario together, but it's not working very well. But just imagine they wanted to uh, introduce a, a tennis bubble. Um, so one of those white for, for indoor courts and it was blocking or, you know, blocking the arch. I mean, that, that would be a good example of um, we, did a good job in, in uh, designating the amenity, but the context is lost. So, you know, it's that vista to the arch. It's the, um, sadly, the trees that, you know, have 
had to come down uh, that the willows along that side of this, you know, and I'm making that up. There is no, <laughs> they're, they're looking, they'd love to have a bubble there. It's not near, I'm just trying to make an example between amenity and cultural landscape. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we look at Forbes, I know the bridge or the, the remnant of the bridge, um, obviously that we'd like, um, you know, if, if you can designate the amenity, it does put focus on that. It does then speak to operations and I'm within operations. So, um, you know, it, if, if a particular amenity, I, I think you do both to, to be honest, because if a particular amenity is designated, that will speak to the operational side of things and, and what we should be doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis to preserve that. The larger cultural heritage landscape then speaks to the, the contextual stuff. You know, and I know with the stone tower, um, I worked on that a little bit. We were really trying to, um, you know, thinking, and I know it's a lot of has happened and I, it's probably a can of worms to, to open that up again. Uh, here, but what we were really trying to get to was how do you preserve this, but also how in context, okay, could we do it in context? It didn't seem that that was possible uh, when we were looking at it. Can you then bring it as close as possible? And, and maybe the broader context is, you know, the American standard building across the, the, the way or, or proximity to the river. Um, and then the adaptive reuse came in and ideas around that and so again you know those things i think in the end need to be taken back to mhac is this is this a you know an appropriate adaptive reuse um does this respect both the context and the amenity itself so however i guess the designations come out we're kind of at the disposal or we're at the you know the, the plan should reflect that uh, with with and I think it's one of the it's not chicken and egg it's egg and chicken scenarios like it'd be nice to have these heritage assessments and then we could put them right into the the master plan right so I I don't know if I answered did I answer your question Michelle or yeah I I think you did I think maybe um, this sort of aspect of it. I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the committee or any of my fellow members, but this would be something I would be very interested in continuing discussions on and, and looking at a way to incorporate with the park plan. Okay. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, Councillor Kimson, do you want to... Uh... Still not working. <laughs> oh dear. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Paul? Through you, Madam Chair, if Councillor Kimson could do it in the chat, if it's a question, um, maybe that's an option. I believe she's left the meeting. Perhaps she's going oh, to try okay. and rejoin and see whether it will work then. Right. Yeah, I've been in, I've been in contact with Councillor Kimson and we're trying to troubleshoot it on our end. So she's okay. just trying to rejoin now. Okay. Okay. I'll give her a minute. Yeah, thanks for posing these questions. I mean, we can always take these questions away too and give further thought to them and maybe send a reply back to you in a, um, before our next meeting or whatever, if, um, if we come up with some other ideas. Sure, we, um, as I said, it's, uh, it's early days. And um, if individuals as residents of Cambridge wanna participate in surveys, public meetings, um, those will come along, we have an engage page that that will have all of those opportunities and uh but if the committee um you know there there will be lots of time for the committee to to submit anything whether it's the actual formal heritage assessments and that whole process uh, or just just comments on, on existing heritage resources and parks or, or how the parks master plan uh, should treat those okay great thank you
Can I give it a try now? It's working. <laughs> I'm on a different computer. That's why. Um, so no, I, I, Michelle actually um, followed up with exactly what I was wondering is how are we going to look at some of our parks that we know have perhaps features that are listed or designated and how they will fit in versus the entire park as we've just recently done with Forbes Park and Certainly, there is no quick, easy answer, but definitely worth um, giving some consideration. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, and I, I'll just, I'm very new to the levels of service and asset management world, and I'm learning more all the time as I, I work with, with others, other great people like uh, Johan in asset management or my director, Mike. Um, but one of the things I think the lessons that's coming out of that is the features are really important to to get into you know and we we inventory all the features um as if i put the planner hat on the context is really important and so i think we do need to have both and i do like sort of what i initially heard from jeremy about about forbes and that there will be individual things um designated as well as the park as a whole i think that's that's if I'd offer my two cents, I think that's the way to go uh, for, for the parks master plan. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Paul. So um, I don't think we have any more questions or comments at this time. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, we'll give some more consideration to the questions you posed and um, we'll uh, get back to you with um, some more comments in the okay. future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Bye everybody. Bye. Okay, so we'll move on to um, our next agenda item. It's a request to alter a part five designated property. It's the sign permit application for 47 Main Street. Um, we have our senior planner, um, Heritage, Laura Waldy here to give a brief overview of the project. And I believe the applicant has indicated that um, he is also available to be brought into the meeting if the committee has any questions for him. Um, That's so, correct, yes. Okay, so uh, we'll hand it over to Laura, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, these are the recommendations that um, are as written that were from your report. Uh, so they are to um, receive the report as well as the um, Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee is being asked to approve the application for a sign permit for the per property municipally known as 47 Main Street. Next slide, please. So the key findings uh, from the report is that this property is part of the Main Street Heritage Conservation District. It was designated in 1984 under part five of the Ontario Heritage Act. So it's uh, getting, uh, getting up to almost uh, 40 years old now, this HCD. Um, the plans for this particular uh, property, um, and you may remember this was the uh, nightlight uh, facility. Um, so there is a new tenant in there, and what they are hoping to do is by day open up a cafe which will um, specialize in waffles and uh, ice cream, and I've been told that they'll also offer some vegan products as well, and by night it will become um, uh, a lounge more for um, adults, so serving alcohol and light appetizers as well. So they have a dual purpose for this particular facility. So they have submitted a sign application and the sign is just as you see here on the picture on the presentation, which is also in your report. It, it consists of a painted sign fascia. So this is uh, the, the blue, which will be painted uh, from a heritage palette. It is going to be painted. So the sign itself is what consists of the lettering. So that is the sign. They're not actually going to be mounting a sign panel up onto the fascia. It's just painting the fascia and then pin screwing in the 
letters themselves. So it's actually quite small in terms of dimensions to sign. So that's why it actually does conform to the sign uh, bylaw section 26, which is the heritage section of the sign bylaw that refers to dimensions and other things for uh, heritage conservation district or designated property signs. Um, so next slide, please. And also to let you know, those letters are not going to be um, internally illuminated. They are going to be illuminated using the existing gooseneck lighting, which are the white lights right above the sign as well. So um, that is really the report in a nutshell. Um, so I will pass it back to the chair then. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, okay, so I guess then um, I will do the mover and the seconder. So the request to alter part five designated property, the sign permit application for 47 Main Street. So can I have the mover please? Sorry, Chair, before proceeding with that, do we want to see if anybody wants to ask questions of the um, of the applicant before placing the motion on the floor? Yeah, sure. Um, does any do any members of the committee have any questions for Laura? Uh, Nancy? Uh, I have a question for Laura. OK. Oh, um, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. We can do questions for staff afterwards. It's just once the motion is on the floor, we can't call the applicant in. So if we oh, need to okay. In, Sorry. Yeah. I no wasn't worries. paying attention. Okay. Let's uh, start that over. Would, do, would anyone like to have the applicant in to answer any questions? Um, Nancy? Again, I'm not sure who this question goes to. Okay. Um, so should I ask yeah, as the applicant for, or... I am just questioning if the the painting as represented in the slide here is covering the trim around the sign fascia, if that is just a Photoshop effect, or if is a sign fascia going to be changed and the trim removed. Laura, are you able to answer that question or should we call in? I, I am. Okay. I am. Yes. Um, so in answer to your question, uh, it is going to be the trim around it as well, too, uh, as well as the sign fascia. So this has been photoshopped in. You're correct. So if you look to either the left or the right of it, um, if you could see where that smoky gray blue is to the right of the Photoshop sign image, yes, right there, that is the sign fascia and the trim is up above and below those wood um, pieces there. All of that is going to be painted uh, that royal blue. Thank you, Laura. That's what I was hoping was the answer. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so now I will go to, um, uh, to ask for a mover and seconder then. Um, Unless so, there are other questions. I think there was another question. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Okay. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> Michelle had her hand up. My apologies. So oh, you move or not ask a question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Michelle, do you have a question? <laughs> No? Okay. All right. So then, um, so the item to request to alter part five designated property, the sign permit application for 47 Main Street. Do I have a mover and a seconder, please? So I have Nancy for the mover and Michelle for the seconder. And so we have the recommendation that report 23-015 MHAC, the request to alter a part five designated property sign permit application for 47 Main Street be received, and that the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee approve the application for a sign permit for the property municipally known as 47 Main Street. 
Um, so now I will ask again um, if the committee has any more questions or comments. Okay, so seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call for the vote, please. Okay, and I just want to remind everyone to please have their cameras on when voting. Hey, Jack O'Donnell. In favor. Thank you. Nelson Cecilia. In favor. Thank you. Nancy Woodman. In favor. Thank you, Nancy. Michelle Goodridge. In favor. And Kimberly Livingston. In favor. And that carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. So we'll move to our next agenda item. And this is again a request to alter a part five designated property, a sign permit and variance application for 43 Main Street. Um, so once again, we'll have Laura Waldi uh, provide us with a brief overview of the report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I actually have a little bit of an update uh, for you with this one as well, but I'll read the uh, recommendations here as they have been printed uh, in your report. That report 23-016, request to alter a part five designated property signed permit application for 43 Main, uh, Main Street be received and that the MHAC not approve the application for a signed permit for the property municipally known as 43 Main Street due to the size being 4.2 square uh, 4.29 square meters and further that the MHAC approves a variance to the sign bylaw to permit a fascia sign measuring three square meters or less for the Swab social boutique at 43 Main Street. Uh, next slide please. So again, this property is, uh, well, it's pretty much adjacent to um, uh, 47 Main Street. So what is going in here is a um, spa and boutique. Uh, it's going to be the Suave Social Boutique. So they'll be uh, moving into this location. And the sign that we had been um, circulated on in terms of a size is what you see here in the picture and it's the same picture that is also reflected in your uh, report in the agenda. So it was measuring 4.29 square meters. I did get an email from the property owner that they have reduced the size of the sign. It has been reduced down to 2.59 square meters. So it has now been almost cut in half, um, almost in half uh, in terms of the sign. So it will fit within the, uh, the fascia. And again, the fascia uh, is the grayish blue to the right hand side of the, yep, yeah, right in there. And then of course your framing is up on uh, the top and the bottom. You can see from this picture that it extended way above the fascia. And that was part of the reason why we were recommending refusal of the application. So reducing it now to 2.59 square meters will bring it to within the signed fascia area. It will be a black sign with white lettering and the uh, yellow colored S. So everything is the same except for the size, which will now allow it to sit, uh, fit inside the sign fascia. Um, so that's the update to that particular report. And I think this ends my presentation as well for this. Uh, and to let you know, the property owner is not available if you have any questions, but uh, I'm pretty sure that if you do have any questions, I should be able to answer them for you. Thank you, Laura. Um, I do have one question. So with the recommendation as it's written, um, um, if the size reduces to um, 2.59 um, square meters, yeah. Um, does it still require a variance to the sign bylaw? Yes, it will, because okay. the, uh, the the sign bylaw says that a sign should be no larger than oh. 1.25 square meters. Okay. So it is larger. So that's okay. why you it would require a variance. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Kimson. Um, thank you very much. And through you to the rest of the group. Um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned. Is there going to be any lighting on the sign at all? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, this will not be uh, an internally illuminated uh, sign. There will be lighting up above. Uh, that will go in at a later date, however, and it will be gooseneck lighting because that is the requirement for the Main Street uh, Heritage Conservation District. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have Nancy. Uh, thank you, Chair, and to Laura. Uh, much the same question as the last one. Will the entirety of the sign fit within the fascia and not obscure the trim around the uh, sign through, fascia? Through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Nancy, yes, that's what I have been told, uh, that it will uh, fit within the sign fascia and not um, interfere with either the trim or anything above or below the trim. And thank you. And does that include the, the single S? Yes, it will okay. be within the actual sign panel itself that will be mounted into the sign fascia. Okay, what is the uh, square meterage of the sign fascia itself? I'm having a little trouble not being able to visualize. Uh, that I do not know the answer to, but I can... Um, I can probably find that out and let the committee know. I can send the committee an email on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Then we have a question from Michelle. Uh, thank you. Um, Laura, when calculating that square footage, or sorry, square meters, um, when it was 4.29, was it calculated with the S being above and then cutting across? Is that why it was so much bigger? Because it didn't look all that bad except that S being up. I realize this is a moot point at this time. I'm just curious how it was calculated. So through you, uh, Madam Chair, to Michelle, uh, yes, that's how it was actually factored in because the S was so tall uh, and the sign itself uh, is on a back black background. The way it was photoshopped in was kind of hard to tell exactly where it fit in within that sign panel, but it did actually fit above, like it went above that um, fascia and everything like that. So that's what did factor it in just because the S was so much larger. Um, so you have to take a measurement of its entire um, height with uh, against the width of it. So that's how uh, we end up getting the um, full measurement for that sign. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions for Laura? Okay, so seeing none, we can now place the motion on the floor. Um, so I will ask for a mover and a seconder for this agenda item. So the item is to request a request to alter a part five designated property assigned permit and variance application for 43 Main Street. So could I please have a mover and a seconder? Okay, I have Nelson for the mover and uh, Michelle for the seconder. And so I'll read the recommendation as written. That report 23-016 MHAC, request to alter a part five designated property, sign permit and variance application for 43 Main Street be received, and that the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee not approve the application for a sign permit for the property municipally known as 43 Main Street due to the size being 4.29 square meters. And further that MHAC approves a variance to the sign bylaw to permit a fascia sign measuring three square meters or less for the Suave Social Boutique at 43 Main Street. Um, do the members of the committee have any questions? Okay. So seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call for the vote. Sorry, do, um, um, is comments available? Any comments, Chair? Oh, yes, any comments? Okay, so no comments. So uh, yes, if you could please um, call for the vote now. Perfect. Jack O'Donnell? In favor. Nelson Cecilia. I'm in, in favor as well. Favor, okay. 
Nancy Woodman. In favor. Michelle Goodridge. In favor. And Kimberly Livingston. In favor. And that carries unanimously. All right, thank you. So um, our final item this evening is was provided to the committee for information purposes and feedback only. Um, so the committee members will not be voting on this item. We have joining us this evening, Stephen Huckabone, the senior civil engineering technologist and Lashia Jones, the cultural heritage specialist with Stantec, giving a presentation regarding the heritage impact assessment completed as part of the evaluation of the bridges located at Millrace Park. Um, so welcome, Stephen and Glacia. Sorry, I hope I haven't mispronounced your name. <laughs> My apologies. That's okay. Thanks. It's it's Lasha. Lasha. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I uh, just wanted to clarify with Laura Waldy. I'm not sure. Um, do you want us to go through the presentation, or was this just for information, or did you want to provide any additional um, uh, overview or, or information or anything like that? Uh, no, I don't have any uh, feedback or anything like that or comments. So it's it's fine for you to go ahead and do the the quick overview of the presentation. Okay, sounds good. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, and just to let everyone know, my Frank or my colleague Frank Smith is also um, on this meeting as well. In case you've got any questions, he was uh, one of the authors of this report here. So uh, we were asked to do a heritage impact assessment for the um, the pedestrian bridges at Millrays Park. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the two timber bridges are built circa 1990s and are due to replacement given their unsafe condition. The park itself is a listed resource. And so based on that, the city requested us to prepare an HIA to review four proposed alternatives and their potential impacts on the Mill, Mill Race Park. Um, the purpose of the modified HIA was to respond to the policy requirements regarding the conservation of cultural heritage resources and land use planning process. Next slide, please. Just to give a quick overview of the site history, um, the mill race uh, dates back quite, quite early in Cambridge's history. In 1837, Robert Dixon built a dam across the Grand River and a mill race along the east bank of the park. The site itself is also associated with the C. Turnbull Company, which was founded in 1854 by Robert Turnbull and John Deans. They manufactured uh, full fashioned underwear, a type of underwear that was regarded as more comfortable and better fitting than other types of the time. In 1890, that company re relocated to the present day Mill Race Park. The present day stone ruins of the park are associated with the mill built for the Turnbull Company in the late 1890s. The mill itself was heavily damaged in the 1970s during severe flooding, and the Millrace Park was opened in 1977 as an early example of adaptive reuse of uh, historic structures. Next slide, please. To, um, to complete the HIA, we did an evaluation of the park according to Ontario Regulation 906 of the Ontario Heritage Act. And we found that the, uh, the mill race itself met four of the criteria. It's an early example of constructed landscape centered around adaptive reuse. It's historically associated with Robert Dixon and the Turnbull Company, who have a longstanding history in Cambridge. It supports the character of an area influenced by stone ruins. And it's physically, functionally, and visually and historically linked to the Grand River and Dam. We also use the city of uh, Cambridge's cultural heritage criteria and found that it met several criteria as well. The mill race is an early structure that served as a catalyst for development. The properties associated again with Robert Dixon, Charles Turnbull, and John Turnbull. The Mill Race ruins are examples of Galt's industrial heritage, and the park is an example of waterfront redevelopment. It's an important contribution to the composition of the streetscape in the area and contributes to the urban design of the Grand River. Next slide, please. I apologize if I'm cutting some of this off. The uh, the bottom of the screen on my my end is cut off, so my, my apologies if I'm missing a few things here. Um, in terms of heritage attributes that we identified in the report, uh, they are the stone ruins as part of, part of the former Turnbull Knitting Factory, the mill race itself consisting of stone walls and sluice gate machinery, the network of circulation routes, including path, bridge crossings over the mill race and staircases in the park, the amphitheater area consisting of seating built into the terrain on timber retaining walls, its physical, physical functional, visual, and historical link with the Grand River and Mill Dam, 
and the landscape grounds with garden beds. Next slide, please. For the impact assessment, there were four alternatives that we reviewed that the city provided to us. The do nothing approach where the bridges remain in situ and nothing, no action is taken. Permanently decommissioning both bridges and not rebuilding with new structures. Demolishing both bridges and rebuilding both structures and demolishing, demolishing bridge two and rebuilding bridge three. We identified direct impacts for alternatives two and four as they impact the bridges that are removed and not replaced, which reflects the, the circulation network of the park. And indirect alternatives were identified for two, three, and four that have the potential to result in indi indirect impacts to the stone ruins through temporary vib vibrations during construction if new structures are added to the, the park. Next slide, please. For mitigation, if alternatives two and four are chosen, we'd identified that supplementary documentation be prepared. So this would change the layout and circulation of the park. So given that the cultural heritage value of the bridges is limited to their role in the circulation network, additional documentation of the bridges would help um, note the contextual relationship and the circulation network within the park and just provide documentation um, as part of the, the record and, and history of the park. If alternatives two, three, and four are chosen and new structures are built, qualified persons with experience in heritage structures should be retained to complete vibration assessments to determine if the levels of vibration um, have any impact on the mill race itself. And should the stone ruins be determined to be within a zone of influence where vibration might occur, additional steps might be taken to um, uh, provide mitigation or um, prevent them from experiencing negative vibration effects. Next slide, please. Uh, I think that might be your last slide. Yes, that is the last slide. Perfect. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, myself and my colleague, are, Frank, are available. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so do I have any questions or comments from the committee? Okay, I don't think we have any uh, questions at this time. So thank you very much for that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It's nice to have you here. So we'll move to our other business. Um, I don't have any chair's comments for this month. I uh, can't believe we're already halfway through the year. The time's flying by. I do believe we will be having a meeting next month, so hopefully um, we'll be able to have most of us in attendance for that meeting. And then I'll pass it on to Councillor Kimson if she has um, any council report or comments for us. Um, thank you very much. And I actually don't have anything to share with you um, right now from council, but if there's anything that um, you'd like me to look into on my end, I certainly welcome anyone to reach out at any time, thank you. Great, thank you. And then uh, Laura, do we have uh, any senior planner heritage updates? Yes, and through you, there is a, a little bit of an update uh, in terms of heritage and that's uh, mainly what's coming up next month that you'll see for uh, reports. So what we're working on next uh, month, for next month is a couple of designations. Uh, one of them I can confirm is, is actually going to be Soper Park. So uh, we had some discussion around that uh, tonight. And one of those um, designation reports that we're bringing forward is Soper Park. So look for that next month. There's also going to be another grant application that will be coming forward and that will be for 10 James Street as well. Um, so they'll be looking for doing some uh, repointing work there as well. Um, we're also working on some other designations as well that will be coming later on in uh, the summer months. Our review of the heritage register is coming along quite well. We have a uh, heritage planning student that's working with us. She's a co-op student and she'll be here with us for the summer. And things have been uh, going quite well in terms of uh, reviewing the heritage register there. Um, so just a very brief update for you guys this month. And uh, just to let you know that we will definitely be having a meeting next month. 
We are hoping to actually have the month of August off. We traditionally take August off as your uh, summer break, your summer recess. Um, where we may not be able to do that is if we have, uh, <laughs> fighting with my cat here, we might have, um, we might have issues um, around um, quorum perhaps, or if um, anybody uh, has an application that they submit into us that um, has a legislative time frame, we might have to have a meeting in August to do that. Um, so that would be the reason why we would have an August meeting, but traditionally we try to keep that available uh, for your summer recess. So um, that's it for my um, uh, update for you this month. Okay, great, thank you. And then for general heritage matters, do we have any updates from the MHAC members? Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any updates, so we'll move to adjourn. Um, we've reached the end of our agenda, and so the final order of business is closing the meeting. So can I please have a mover and a seconder to uh, close the meeting? So I have Nancy for the mover and Jack for the seconder. And the recommendation is that the MHAC meeting does now adjourn at 8.11 p.m. Would you like me, through you, Chair, would you like me to call for the vote? Uh, yes, please, yes. Okay. Jack O'Donnell? In favor. No worries. Uh, Nelson Cecilia? In favor. Thank you. Nancy Woodman? In favor. Michelle Goodridge? In favor. Okay, and Kimberly Livingston? In favor. And that carries unanimously. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, I will see you on July 20th, 2023 at 7 p.m. for our next meeting. Have a great evening and stay safe.